God is the creator of life. A Bible says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Jeremiah 1 5. For you were created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My plan was not hidden from you when I was made in a secret place. And I was thrown together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days were damned for me, for it's written in your book, for one of them came to be. Psalm 149, 13 from 16. For I know the plans I have for you, cares the Lord. Plans were past for you, for not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Jeremiah 29, 11. Well, I want to say at the beginning that I realize that probably 90% of you or 95% of you stand with me on this uh, very important topic. But I also recognize that there are some people perhaps sitting in this room this morning and many across our country and world who wear the name Christian but don't stand in the same place that I stand on this issue. And uh, I have to say at the beginning, I'm not always right. There's, there are times that I'm not always right. And if you don't believe that, ask my wife. She'll tell you. But on this issue, I think I'm right. I think I'm right. And I think you think I'm right, too, most of you. And I just want to tell you at the beginning, this could make some of you uncomfortable because we're going to talk about a few things that some of you think I have no business talking about. But I can't. I can't not talk about it. In other words, I have to talk about it <clears throat> because I stand in front of God for you one day and I'll be held accountable for what I say and how I teach his word and, and what I present to you is what I believe. So I have to, I have to speak the truth and uh, the consequences, let them be what they are. But, uh, this is a controversial topic, the topic of abortion, and I just want you to know that I, I could have been aborted and you could have been aborted. Right? You see, when I, when I was born, I was the third child of my 19-year-old mother. Third child of my 19-year-old mother. And my oldest, uh, or my only sister, uh, full sister, is here this morning. And she uh, is not quite two years older than I am, but there's a child, a brother between us. And had we been living, had my mother or parents been living after 1973, there might have been the influence or the, uh, the encouragement or the motivation that, hey, you can't possibly have another child. Do you know what's causing this? You've got to stop this. And I suspect that most abortions, and I, I believe this can be verified, but I suspect that most abortions are done really out of a matter of convenience for the mother or the mother's mother and not out of a matter of safety for the health of the child. When you think about it, you and I both could have been aborted. Had we been born, and some of you were, after 1973 when abortion became legal, we could have been aborted. Now, it's, it's a little bit uh, wild for me to think that a young person could grow up in the church and understand God's word and know what he says and value life yet still get to that point in their life where abortion would become an option. Yet we have a young mother here this morning who shared that very thing with me that she knew abortion was wrong. She knew that life was right. 
yet after a series of bad choices in her life, she was pregnant and the thought of abortion was a real thing. So we, we, none of us are immune to covering up our bad choices, are we? Or hiding our, what we might think are mistakes. But you know what? I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe that God is in control. I believe nothing happens outside of God's control. A, a sparrow falls, or you get hurt, or you make a bad choice. You get pregnant, but God is still in control. Thus, there are no mistakes. There are no mistakes. And that should, that should bear some influence in your life and in the lives of the people out there who, who are considering this option. You and I really could have been aborted. <clears throat> and so this message today is, uh, you know, is, is about this topic, but I don't want to talk just about the negative. Now, in 1973, when Roe v. Wade, uh, and if you're not familiar with that, you can read up on this, and you know that's the amazing thing about preaching in this modern age. There's nothing I can say that you can't find out almost immediately. Uh, you know, on your smartphone, you can follow my message, but you can also get online and say, is that right? So I gave out some statistics last service, and I can feel my phone when you're texting me, and it vibrates, and one of those texts was, hey, that number was wrong. On, that, uh, on the number of abortions every year since Roe v. Wade. Uh, and I told him, I said, well, mine was more dramatic. Mine was a little higher. But uh, he, he, uh, this guy, he said that there's been 1.2 million abortions every year on average since Roe v. Wade. And you can do the math on that, but it's somewhere north of 50 million babies that have been crushed in their womb or sucked out by a vacuum or uh, burned to death by some kind of saline injection. I don't even know the ways they're doing an abortions these days because it's not been a, on my radar uh, how they're doing them. That they're doing them is. But I want to tell you this week, I, I got messed up uh, because I, I went online. You can do this online, and I don't encourage you to do it. And I watched an abortion. Now, of course, I couldn't see everything, but I had a, it was a video made and then some live footage and a doctor who was explaining exactly what they were doing. And it, it made me sick. It made me sick. My heart went out to that woman whose feet were in those stirrups. I wondered about the, the hearts of the doctor who was performing the procedure and the nurses in that room who are who have given their lives to helping and saving life and here they were all accomplices to really first degree premeditated murder that's just what it, what it was so I don't encourage you to do that, but if you're still on the fence about this issue, if you're not sure that, hey, the, the child has a choice, that the child is life, that the mother's rights trump the baby's rights, if you're on the fence about that, go, go watch this. Go watch it uh, online. Don't let your kids see it. And you may want to pray hard before you see it. Now listen, folks, this is not a political issue. It's not a... Uh, it's not a, a cultural, it is a cultural issue, but not primarily. It is a spiritual issue. It's theological. It's really what you believe about God and what God believes about the world and about what's going on around us. That's what this issue is. So it's really, it's where you stand. So I just want to say today that, that, that I am for life. <clears throat> this is Norma uh, McCorvey of, of Jane Roe of the Roe v. Wade, and she's come to this conclusion now. She says, I think it's safe to say that the entire abortion industry is based on a lie, and I am dedicated to spending the rest of my life undoing the law that bears my name. Because she understands it now. Here's an ironic thing, too. 
if you, uh, you may have seen this on Facebook or somewhere, but that picture on the left is like a one-celled amoeba or some kind of a, a little, you know, a hint of life. And if, if, if scientists discovered this on Mars or some other planet, they would be uh, celebrating, wouldn't they? It would be like, we have found life on another planet. We are not the only ones here. But when they find the picture on the right on this planet in a womb, that's not life. That's a fetus with no life. But you know, the, the Bible is, uh, is clear on this. And I just want you to, to know I am for life. I want you to tweet this. I want you to say this. I want you to get comfortable with this if that is you're convinced about this. Now, people say, well, Pastor, what about rape and incest? What about those women who are, uh, you know, forced in that condition? What about them? Do you know... Uh, According to what I saw on the website <clears throat> that keeps statistics like this, of the 1.2 million abortions done every year, only about 3,000 or so. Now that sounds like it is a big number. It's too big. But it doesn't happen very often is what I'm trying to say. And remember, if God's God, if he's in control, if he's sovereign, there are no accidents. Are there? There aren't any. Now, why am I for life? Well, first of all, I'm for life because God is for life. Did you know that it was his idea? Life was? It's his idea. Your life was his idea. What does that do to you? How do you what do you think when, when you consider that there was a God who gave careful thought to your conception, to your birth, to your fingerprints, to your mindset, to your little personality, to your everything a god thought about it first that should blow you away that god created you special he th he thought about you first and you were still born he knew you and yet he still gave you life i know some of you got kids and you're thinking you know that bill cosby line I brought you into this world, and I can take you out of this world. But I want to tell you, this was God's idea. Life was his idea. Listen, uh, listen to what the Bible says. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God did. He created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. So there we have right there, this was God's idea. And when life of humanity came to bear, he put his stamp, his image, his likeness on that, that life. He didn't do it to the animals. He didn't do it to insects or plants. He put his image on humanity. What does that mean? It means we have something they don't have. You know, I'm not an environmentalist. I love the environment, but I, I think humanity matters to God more than anything else. And this image was passed down. Listen, when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. So what that says is, Adam had the likeness of God, so his likeness was the likeness of God. So when this likeness was passed to his son Seth, then <clears throat> Seth now had the likeness of God. You know what this means? This means that, that if you have little children, if you're, if you're uh, then, you know, it, it, they may be, you might say they're hellions or they might, they might not make you happy. They might, you might want to spank them and who knows? Uh, they were made in God's image. But there's more. Listen to what the Bible says in Psalm 51. David said, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. What he's talking about there is a sin nature. In my mind, what he's talking about there is the ability to choose right and wrong. He said in Psalm 139, you heard Jordan read that and sing it. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. God told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before uh, you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So what this is saying is, it's not just the children after they're born that have the image of God, but it's the babies in the womb. Now, 1973, when Roe v. Wade was passed, they didn't have sonograms. But now we have some amazing 
sonograms. And some of you have shared those on Facebook, and they are absolutely incredible. Have you ever seen a 4D sonogram? They're crazy, aren't they? I'll show you some. <clears throat> Here's a, this is not a 4D one. This is a, kind of an older one. This, uh, this is eight weeks. This is eight weeks old, and we know that eight weeks old in the uh, womb can suck their thumb. They can respond to sound. They can, uh, there's some indication, some scientists believe that they, they will dream, that they can dream, and uh, they can definitely react to pain. They've seen as they insert a needle in there to draw fluids out or something, they may accidentally hit the baby or maybe get close and the baby withdraws. But let's look at these. Here's some 4D. This is at 16 weeks, and I want to tell you most of the abortions that happen are up to this point, 16 weeks and under. Now, are you telling me that's, I mean, I know it kind of looks uh, massy or fleshy or whatever, but if you're a mama or you're a daddy looking at that, would you not say, that looks like my husband? <laughs> Look at him. He's getting ready to tell me something. Or he's giving me the thumbs up sign. It's all good in here. Leave me alone. Here's uh, 21 weeks. <clears throat> Some more 21 and past. Uh, this is my favorite right here. <laughs> and we cannot deny that, that it's life. Somebody came up to me later and said, you know, why does the government allow this? Well, the, what, the, what, the, what they have to be convinced of is that it's life inside the womb. And with all the technology we have today, there is no way they can deny this. They can't. Even, uh, even pro-choice people, for instance, this woman named Mary Elizabeth Williams. She wrote an article in last January. <clears throat> She's uh, pro-choice, and she wrote this. The title of the article is, So What If Abortion Ends Life? Yet I know, she said, that throughout my own pregnancies, I never wavered for a moment in the belief that I was carrying a human life inside of me. I believe that's what a fetus is, a human life. And that doesn't make me one iota less solidly pro-choice. Here's the complicated reality in which we live, she says. All life is not equal. That's a difficult thing for liberals like me to talk about, lest we wind up looking like death panel loving kill your grandma and your precious baby stormtroopers. Yet a fetus can be a human life without having the same rights as the woman in whose body it resides. She's the boss, the mother. Her life and what is right for her circumstances and her health should automatically trump the rights of the non-autonomous entity inside of her always. Do you hear what she said? She said, okay, I'll concede that it's life, but it doesn't matter because that life is trumped by the life of the mother. So if the mother wants to kill the child, the mother can kill the child if it's best for her. And so this is the mentality of a lot of folks on the pro-choice side, that it may be life, but still, it's the mother's right to kill the baby. And you and I are like, well, what, what about the baby's rights? What about that baby? Just because there's a life inside a life doesn't mean that one life is more important than the other life. What about the case of when the mother's life is in danger? You know, that's a tough issue, and I'm not, I, I don't know all the answers to that, but I know that family, that couple should be praying and asking God, and I think God will give them leading and direction. And I, I, you know, I don't know, and I've never been in this situation, thank the Lord, but uh, I would always err on the side of life. And, you know, God is, God is still God. So I am for life. I'm for life. Are you for life? So what should we do? What should I do if I'm for life? You know, can one person make a difference? Can one church do anything? I mean, should we hold signs up on the road and picket abortion clinics? What should we do? Does that do any good? Does it help? I don't know of anybody who ever changed their mind because somebody was holding a sign. Do you? Well, there's some things I think we should do. First of all, I think we should repent. You say, wait, Dave, I didn't have an abortion. Yeah, but I think we should repent of our indifference. I think we've been indifferent about this. We, we're almost like Mary Elizabeth Williams. You know, hey, it's her body. It's her life. If she wants to kill the 
The child, that's her business, not mine. Why should I intervene? I, you know, it's not affecting me. So we're a little indifferent. I think we should repent of our apathy in this and our indifference and our inactivity. And secondly, you know what? I think we should pray. Listen, folks, this is a spiritual battle. And, and everywhere in the Bible, uh, from front to back, that talks about this battle that we're getting ready to face, it's bathed in and preceded by prayer. You should pray, you should pray for these pregnant women who are considering this. You should pray for the, the, the fathers of these babies. You should pray for uh, their parents who might be pushing their young daughters to do this. You should be praying for abortion doctors and nurses who participate in this. Pray for a change of heart. Pray that they would see and understand what God sees in the womb. I think you should pray for, for workers on the front line of this battle. Uh, this morning I have Phil chatting here. Phil, stand up real quick if you would. Phil uh, is, uh, works with the Woman's Choice Pregnancy Resource Center here. Phil and his wife. Now, Phil's going to be standing up here uh, at the front after the service because I want to tell you, they are they're trying to operate right on the front lines of the battle because the Woman's Choice Pregnancy Resource Center educates young women about what is there and encourages them to consider keeping their life, choosing life. And I want to tell you, there aren't many places like that but Phil's going to be up front here to talk to you. He works at Woman's Choice. We support them regularly. Now, just this week, Carolyn Mullins from our church, who has a good friend who works up there. You can go ahead and be seated, Phil. And by the way, they need help. Carolyn was up there, and a young woman accidentally went in the wrong door because you know what's right next door to the Pregnancy Resource Center? The abortion clinic. It's right next door. And this young girl evidently made a wrong turn and went in the resource center. And when she found out that they weren't going to do her abortion, that they were going to try to educate her, she turned and walked out as Carolyn was walking in. And Carolyn said it just broke her heart. And she wanted just to embrace this young, obviously teenage girl. And I tell you what, I don't know if I could work in that situation every day and see these young women going across the parking lot or coming here and hearing what we have to say and then still making decisions. And I get emails from his wife, Linda, and I tell you, there's, there's many times where we're just praising God, yea, God, for that, when another one's saved. And there's times where we don't know the future of that child and it doesn't look good. Now, <clears throat> Phil just told me this morning that they, are, they, they need a nurse-type person, nurse-slash-medical director to work for them. They've just raised the money to hire a nurse Somebody that can do the sonograms or help with the sonograms. They need a doctor to kind of support it, right? And they need a nurse to work full-time that can also raise money for them and talk about this issue in churches. So if you're a nurse and you would like to get involved here, here's a way for you to get involved. Here's the sign that's between their parking lots. <clears throat> this is an actual sign in Charleston between the abortion clinic and the pregnancy resource center. Says this building, warning, warning, look at that. You think you're walking into a radioactive area, don't you? The building behind this sign is an anti-choice, anti-birth control crisis pregnancy center. It is not affiliated with the Women's Health Center. Do not follow the bed, uh, red and white signs. You know what I see that as? I see that as that they're getting desperate. We've got them on the run. Why else would they put a sign up? They think they're losing customers, don't they? They think they're losing business. And in fact, they are. Since 2011, the rate of abortion, according to what I read, has declined a little bit. And there certainly aren't as many abortion clinics in the country as there used to be. But unfortunately, we have one right here in Kanawha County. We need to repent. We need to pray for, for these folks. But you know what? We also need to vote for life. Now listen, I told you this wasn't a political issue. But it should affect your politics. It really should. Now listen, <clears throat> here's the way I handle it. And I know there are people uncomfortable about me talking about politics, even saying the word in church. Isn't there the separation of church and state? 
Well, if we study that, it doesn't mean that the, that the church is supposed to stay out of the state. It meant that the state was supposed to stay out of the church. You can't tell me how to do church or what to believe. But it doesn't mean I can't influence or take it with me. So I'll tell you, when I go into the voting booth or when I go to the grocery store or when I go to Walmart or when I go anywhere, I don't leave my faith at home depending on where I'm going. Do you? And I especially don't when I go down to East Brook Elementary School on Bills Creek Road in a week or so. And I go into that booth and I look at those names on that list and I see, are they pro-life? Yeah, but pastor, that's a one-issue thing. You can't vote for just one issue. Yeah, I can. Listen, I voted for Democrats and Republicans, both. There are some pro-life politicians I think are morons. Pro-life. And I won't vote for them. I will not vote for you just because you're pro-life. So you stick that on your flyer, that doesn't guarantee it. But I'll tell you something else. I won't vote for you unless you are pro-life. But you're a one-issue voter. No, no, no. Let me explain this to you. Let's suppose we had some guy running for office for president. And he said, I can turn this economy around. I know what to do. I can fix these racial problems. I can do this. And we were convinced that he could do it. But then one day along the campaign trail, he said, Hey, I just want to tell you guys something. He probably wouldn't offer this, but it came out. Here's where we messed up. We messed up way back when we let women start voting. Amen. I didn't hear any amens on that. That's where we messed up. So we can fix everything, but we just got to take women's rights to vote back from them. Would you vote for that guy? Not if you want a happy life. Happy wife. You wouldn't vote for him, and not just for that reason, but because you think, what a dumb idea. Well, that's one issue. He can do everything else you want, but that's just one issue. Well, that's how important this is to me, and it should be important to you. I, I, I won't vote for you just because you're pro-life, but I won't vote for you unless you are pro-life. Now, if you're thinking, preacher, you can't talk about this. Yes, I can. I didn't tell you who to vote for. I didn't tell you what political party to vote for. I'm just telling you it ought to matter to you when you put a man in office that's going to make a decision that's going to affect not only your life, but the lives of your children and perhaps children for the last 30 years like Roe v. Wade. It's going to matter, a man or a woman. And to me, I want one of the most important issues to them to be that I am for life. The last thing I think we need to do is we need to step up. Listen, someone said that Christians aren't really pro-life. They're pro-birth. In other words, we want the birth to happen. But after that, we don't really care. Babies born into drug-addicted homes. What, four or five out of ten at Thomas born with drug addictions in their system? That doesn't matter to us. Just so they're born. And all the other conditions under which children are born by. Listen, if you're going to be pro-life, we can't stop with birth. We've got to get more involved. We've got to step up. One thing you can do, some of you can adopt. You can adopt a child that does not have parents or any kind of a future without someone saying, I will take you. I will love you. Some of you are adopting. And I commend you for that. Some of you, it's an expensive road, but it doesn't have to be expensive today. I have a young lady with us this morning. Missy, would you stand up? This is Missy Stevens, because here's another thing you can do. <clears throat> you can be a foster parent. You can be a foster parent. You know, there are 400, almost half a million kids in the U.S. who are in the foster care system. Now listen, that's not a really big number. It sounds like it, but it's not in the US. Someone did the math on this and they said if just half of the membership of every church in America, every evangelical church in America would become a foster parent, their foster care system would go out of existence. It'd go out of existence. You're thinking, oh, I'm not sure about that. 
I can tell you from experience, it's not easy. It doesn't always work. There's a lot of stuff that goes on. But I want to tell you, when you keep the big vision and you say, look, here's a child that needs a chance at life. Good life. A life, the same kind of life that I might provide for my own children. This child would not get. Missy's going to be standing right up here uh, after the service. And if you have a question about adoption in West Virginia or foster care, I want you to come up and talk to Missy and exchange information. She works for Braley and Thompson, and she works with us in our foster, with our foster daughter. And, uh, and she's just a great young lady, good friends with Sarah Ferry, who was in her first service, and she can answer all your questions. And if she can't get an answer to them today, she'll get you an answer. Maybe some of you have thought, boy, we're done with this now. We can rest. Maybe foster care is something for you to consider. I mean, really, do you care about life? Are you, are you for life or are you just for birth? Thank you, Missy. Uh, this is Missy's first time here. I appreciate you being here. There's other things. You know, Carl and Tammy Mullins, one of our elders and his wives, when they were uh, several years ago, they were temporary emergency foster parents for babies that needed placement, and they would keep them for a few weeks or a few months before being placed. And what an incredible story they have. But there's more. Look, you, you could babysit for young parents who are here if you want to be for life. You could, you, you could help a young family, a young couple. You could support them in some way. You could be honorary grandparents if their grandparents aren't around here. You could pray for teachers. You know, teachers work with children. If you're pro-life, you've got to be for teachers. You could pay them more too, couldn't we, honey? Yeah. No, I mean, you could... There's a lot of things you can do when you think about being for life. I am for life. Where's your niche? What's your passion? Where's God calling you to get in on this, this challenge, this struggle, this journey, this battle that we're fighting every day? Some of you may work at the grassroots there at the abortion uh, uh, clinics or, you know, or trying to stop that. Some of you may be up the road somewhere and, and you know, teenage, young teenage girls who don't have a home and need a place for a few years. Before they go out into this world, they need somebody that will love them. Try to teach them what's right and wrong. How to keep themselves pure. Make right choices. Maybe that's you. Where are you? Phil's going to be here. Missy's going to be here. Uh, come up and talk to them and find out what you can do. Listen, we can shake our fist at the darkness and wave a sign. Or we can step up and be lights can be a light. I love Psalm 139. It's just an incredible psalm. Because what this song says is uh, what it says. And what, this is what God says. I'm for life. How about you? Stand up with me. Rusty's going to lead us in this closing song. And if you know it, sing it with him. If you don't know it, just stand there and listen and consider the implications of this song. But I'm inviting you to life today. If you're dead in your sins, if you're not a Christian, I'm inviting you to consider today God's gift to you of your life. It was his idea. He has a plan for you. If you want to come make a first-time decision to accept him, I'm inviting you to come. Maybe you, want to need, you need prayer or you want to put roots down here. Just come to me up here as we sing, and uh, we'll talk about it.